Susan Berger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, hi everyone. Um, I, I have a few slides to go through. The very best way to keep informed with uh, about connecting to Collections Care is to join the announce list. And this is the email address for it. Or you can follow us on fi uh, Twitter or like us on, uh, you know. Um, and if you need to reset your password, this is the email to use. If you need to contact me, this is my email. And um, John asked me to mention, if, if you're interested in getting the Credly badge, which is an electronic badge that says you've taken this course, so it would be like going to a meeting and getting a certificate that says you participated in some professional development. Um, you need to listen to all the webinars, and you need to do the assignments. And the webinars get, the recordings get posted usually within a day of the uh, live webinar. And if you go on the, on the education website, you'll find that it changes from live content to recorded content. And you need to listen to the webinar before you can go to the next stage. So just keep that in mind. And I will collect all the questions for John at the end. And I have one more slide. These are the things that are coming up. Next week, we have a webinar on, uh, on copyright. And, and then we have one on botanical collections and natural disasters. So even if you're in a historic house and you have a historic garden, that this, this one will be of interest. Both of those webinars are free. And then we have the Planning Your Reorg project, which is a course that's going to start the end of March. And Reorg is an international program from ICROM. This is being co-hosted by ICROM and CCI and us. And it's the first time we've done something like this in the US. So uh, you can go to our website to look at that. And without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to John. So thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everybody, to week two of Collections Management for Small Rural Cultural Institutions. Last week, we talked about the definition of collections and collections management and the significance of selecting objects for collections and what it means when those objects then are musealized and become part of the collection. Uh, this week, we're going to concentrate uh, on the day-to-day -day management of collections. And we're going to take a look first at where you start if nothing has been started yet with your collection, on, as well as registration and cataloging, storage environments, enclosures and supports, inventories, and housekeeping. So that's a, a fair amount to cover, but I believe we can uh, get, make it all happen here today, if you bear with me. Uh, I do encourage everyone to participate in the weekly discussions on the website. There's been some participation, but not a lot. But remember, the more you participate, the more you will get out of this course. Uh, this week's assigned readings include three selections from museum registration methods. There's, taking, uh, there's marking objects, marking specific kinds of objects and numbering. And then there is a selection from Museum Magazine on taking a fresh look at provenance. As far as the project, uh, as Susan said, you need to uh, make sure you've listened to the webinar first. But don't forget to post your short essay on the needs assessment of your institution based on the topic that we talk about each week. And I will mention that again at the very end and give you a little more specific idea of what I'm looking for. So one of the questions I get frequently is, where do you start if absolutely nothing has been started? This is frequently what happens with smaller institutions as collections accumulate. And but no one really does anything about cataloging them or doing inventory. And uh, we are lucky there's a very good resource out there called Managing Previously Unmanaged Collections by Angela Kipp. And it's a, it's a very helpful book. And plus, Angela has a great sense of humor. And so she can tell you how to get started if you have nothing. You have no policies, no inventory, no procedures, no catalog. And what she says, her, her basic message, is keep the big picture in mind, but start with a series of small steps so that you don't get overwhelmed. And she also points out that it's really important when you're first getting organized 
not to let yourself get distracted by worrying a lot about particular individual objects that you know you may think are more important than others, because that will just distract you. That that part can come later. So what Angela recommends is start out by counting the objects you have, and if you have the space, separate those objects into logical groups. But even if you don't have that kind of space, at least start with that count. And then you should start out whatever documentation that you have that goes with the objects so you can tell what they are and where they came from. And you have to remember that before you can begin registration, you have to get organized. So there's a, a series of other things that you can do. And one of them is you want to document what you have. So one of the easiest ways to do that initially, if you've got nothing else uh, in, in the way of an inventory or catalog, is begin by arranging things and taking photographs of them. And if you're inheriting a room full of objects, my recommendation is you take photographs of the room and the objects where they are in the room when you start. This way, if it turns out that things were associated in some way, you'll be able to reconstruct that from your photographs. Angela suggests making a sketch map of the room of where things are so that, again, you can make those correlations later. As you do your inventory, you should look over things for anything that poses an immediate problem. So that might be something that is broken, an object that you think is too dangerous to leave out, or something that is very fragile, or something in danger of being separated from its documentation. Once you've got that done, you can begin sorting objects into broad categories and then do your inventory and from there move on to a catalog. So if you have space, a good idea is to sort the objects out into logical categories. But sometimes we're faced with a situation where we're still crowded. We don't even have that kind of space. But you do try to provide on your inventory list a name for every object. And if you don't have a name, that's OK. You can just describe it. And the object in this picture is an example. This is an object that uh, I acquired some time ago. And I have no earthly idea what it is. Uh, I do have a catalog of objects that I use in teaching. So I have this described as a green metal box, but it surely has a better name. But you know that's enough for now. As you make your inventory, you'll be looking at this collection. And it's a good idea to put on the inventory those objects you do not intend to keep, because you do want to make a record of everything that you had when you got started. So you don't have to know what everything is. You just need to figure out a name or short description you can use and get an inventory list. And from there, you can proceed with getting organized uh, with your collection. So I mentioned provenance, Susan, that we had an article on that. Um, before objects are accessioned, most museums do what's called provenance research. And this is uh, referring to creating a chronology of the history of the ownership of an object from its place of creation through the current ownership. And if you have very little documentation, you really won't be able to do that. But this is a way to figure out how much documentation you have. The word provenance comes from a French word provenir that means to originate. and kind of helps you remember what that means. And this is a, a way we uh, differentiate authentic objects from fakes. We prove ownership. And we can also use it to study the past. In some collections, provenance research is extremely critical. One a good example of that is art collections, where art can be stolen and hidden away for long periods of time and then reappear on the market. If you have good provenance research, you can detect these problems before they occur, because you, you, know, you don't want your museum to acquire a stolen object. Provenance research has been in the news a lot lately because of the emphasis on Nazi-era art. And this was art confiscated by the Nazis uh, between 1933 and 1945 in World War II. And it's provenance research that has enabled many of the original owners or the heirs of those owners to find these objects when they wind up in museums. And so the majority of museums that acquired these objects did not know they were buying uh, stolen art. But good provenance research can help elucidate uh, who the original owners were. So one of the readings this week is by Tracy uh, Berg Fulton. It's called Taking a Fresh Look at Provenance. And I think you'll find it very helpful. Tracy is very tech savvy, and she has some ideas for, for sorting things out. And as she says, ultimately, provenance research is the tool that can help us talk to our visitors about the humanity and the objects. And this is an example of an object I just saw a few weeks ago at an exhibit in uh, Cotter when I was there. And it, it's a sarcophagus relief that was 
was at a, the, from the Palmyra Museum in Syria. The exhibit was, was about Syria and some of the loss of cultural treasures that country has suffered recently due to warfare. And in this case, the provenance research had gone on to uh, say quite a bit about what this object showed. An aristocratic warrior mounted on a camel with a particular kind of saddle. So it's, it's a good example of how this kind of research can uh, help make the object more meaningful as well as give you a path of ownership. Uh, what we're, our main thing we're going to talk about today is registration and cataloging. And because the registration, um, I'm sorry, uh, registration and cataloging. You know, registration is an overall term that refers to accessioning, cataloging, labeling, and marking. You'll find in the literature a lot of terms are used as synonyms like registration and accessioning that really shouldn't be. But registration is the overall term for all of these things that you do to establish your right of legal ownership over an object. And this, this is the thing that preserves association of objects and, and information. So this is a, a photograph of my wife, Julianne Snyder, who is the assistant director of the Earth and Mineral Sciences Museum and Art Gallery at Penn State. And she is uh, doing registration in the collection room. She has her computer on a portable cart. She can wheel in and work with the objects there in order to record all the information that she needs. So this is one way that it can get done. Uh, what registration does is because it preserves the association between the object and the information about the object, uh, it helps you uh, by enhancing the interpretation of the objects in the collection by giving you this uh, amount of detailed information. It also helps you in the preservation of objects because you record critical information about the objects, where they came from, their condition upon arrival, and how they've been preserved once they've been in your collection. The registration system also provides you a means to identify each object and account for each object in the collection. And this helps fulfill your museum's legal obligations to care for the collections that you hold in the public trust. And sort of the, the reverse of that is that an inadequate registration system will cause objects to actually lose value, because you will separate them from uh, the information about them that gives them their value. So one of the things you want to think about is how that information is going to be recorded. So we're going to discuss the details of documentation uh, next week in webinar number three. But here I wanted to point out that the way we record information is important. Uh, it should be recorded in a permanent manner using archival uh, quality stable materials. Historically, that meant acid-free paper and an ink that matched the paper. And writing the information down in a bound ledger book to provide a permanent record of the collection. I still think that is an important step, although many museums skip it and they go directly to recording digital information. And my issue here is that although that digital information is extremely useful, it is not permanent. And, I, and we will talk more next week about why digital information is not permanent. My personal belief is we need both. We need to keep a handwritten registration book where objects are logged in by hand on acid-free paper with good ink in a bound ledger that cannot, so the pages cannot be rearranged. But we also need those electronic databases that list the objects, because they are extremely useful. So we can say that there's a, a simple test of, uh, of a registration system. And this it doesn't matter what kind of registration system you have, whether it's manual or uh, whether it's electronic. But my version of the test is that, number one, any intelligent person should be able to come in and use the system without you present. If, you, if your system is so complicated you have to explain it, it's probably not a very good system. Secondly, using that system, you should be able to find any object in the collection by looking at the registration system and finding an object number. And then uh, you should be able to do the opposite. If you have an object with a number on it, you should be able to find uh, all of the pertinent documentation about it. So if you can do all three of these, then however your registration system works, and whether it doesn't matter if it's manual or electronic, then it's, it's a good functioning system. Uh, from there, it comes down to a matter of detail. And that depends on, on how you want to do things. So this is an image of an exhibit on the old registration system at a wonderful museum, the Mercer Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And this exhibit illustrates several important characteristics of registration systems. 
In the original museum, they had a bound ledger book that they used for cataloging, and they later replaced that with a series of cards. And you see one of those pre-printed cards here with information typed in. They also have out the materials they use to mark the objects. They put down a white undercoat of paint, and then they label them with, uh, with an ink pen using an acid-free uh, India ink, and then they covered that over with a thin layer of varnish. And so they had then the uh, registration number, and you can see it in the upper left-hand portion of the card, and they will mark it on that saw. And so that linked the documentation up to the object. So that's kind of a nice visual of what registration does. One thing unusual about the Mercer Museum, and the reason I picked them as an example, is most museums hide their registration numbers on a part of the object that will not be seen while it's on exhibit, but they actually use that as part of their exhibit. So they label their, their registration numbers, their accession numbers, in great big letters on the objects. And as you went through the museum, you could jot down the number of any object you were interested in and then go down. And in the old days, you could go down and actually look through the original catalog to look up information. That catalog was later replaced by a photocopy and is now being is now been replaced by a uh, uh, database where you can look at a computer terminal. So it's not as much wear and tear, but it's still a, I thought a very interesting way to do it. This way, they don't put many object labels in, and they put in thousands and thousands of objects in their exhibits. So if you ever get a chance to see the Mercer Museum, it's in Doylestown, is uh, suburban Philadelphia, and it's it's quite worth a visit to uh, to go take a look at. So a little bit of vocabulary. I, I want to give you some definitions of some key words that we use in discussing registration because, as, as I mentioned, there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion in the literature about what these mean. Uh, if you want to check on the exact meanings of words, there are a couple of good glossaries. One of them is in Museum Registration Methods number five. And there's also one in Things Great and Small Collection Management Policies. So we'll begin with acquisition. An acquisition is something that is acquired by a museum. But that does not necessarily mean that a trans, uh, ownership has been transferred. Uh, accession uh, is an acquisition that the institution has taken legal ownership. And accession may be composed of a single object, or it may be more objects than more than one object. For instance, in natural history museums, it is common that an accession is anywhere from tens to hundreds to thousands of specimens that all come in collected at the same time and in the same place. Uh, history and anthropology museums tend to do the same, but with smaller numbers of objects in their accessions. Most art museums acquire objects one by one, and they typically uh, have each accession uh, for one object. Uh, so generally speaking, an accession is one or more objects received from a single source at a single time. So that could be 400 specimens collected on a field trip to Canada. It could be a single fossil. It could be an entire library, or it could be just one painting. So this, this is a, a one used in many different ways. Accessioning is that process of transferring the ownership of an acquisition to the museum. And so this means recording the information. Uh, acquisitions cannot be added to the collection or cataloged until they have been accessioned, until you have taken possession of them. The accession number is a unique number assigned to an object or to a group of objects that comprise the accession. And again, in some museums, particularly art museums, the accession number is the only number used to identify an object. But in other museums, particularly natural history museums or with archaeology collections, the accession number refers to a large number of objects, so a catalog number is used to identify individual objects. So we're doing the same thing. We're giving objects an identifying number. We just tend to call them different things. The accession record contains the information that documents where the accession material came from, a brief description of it, and how the museum came about uh, getting ownership, whether it was a gift or a donation or what have you. Uh, Registration is the process of recording the accession records in serial order. And the registration number is uh, a synonym for accession number. Those are, are frequently used interchangeably. And the image in this slide is an interesting one. This is an entry in the National Park Service Master Catalog. And that master catalog contains cards like this for all 45 million objects 
that are held in 380 park collections around the United States. And the catalog is kept on these cards. They're printed out and housed at a park service museum in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. So people who think their collections are too big and, and cataloging them would be too complicated, I like to point out that the park service has managed to catalog 45 million of them from 380 different collections. So nothing is impossible. Uh, a catalog is a list of the objects in the collection. Uh, cataloging is the process of organizing uh, the accessioning information. And to, to remember what that means, think about the fact that to catalog, this means to place into categories. So it's a way of, of further refining your accessioning information. In most museums, the catalog number is a unique number assigned to a particular individual object when you're cataloging. And as I mentioned, not all museums use catalog numbers, but many do. So your number on your object could be an accession number. It might be called a registration number. It might be a catalog number. But those numbers all do uh, the same thing. They all uh, keep track of the objects in a collection. And here we have a photocopy of the catalog of the Scant collection from London from 1656. So not all of those objects are still around, but the catalog is. So we actually know what was in the collection. And so often your catalog will outlast your collection. Well, once you have that number assigned, you need to mark it on the object. So the succession number or catalog number needs to be on the object in some way. There are many ways to mark objects some good, some bad, some that are downright destructive. We're not going to go into all, to all the details about how to mark objects, because that is covered in today's readings. So there are just too many variations to do it. Uh, but in general, the numbers on the object should not interfere with the regular use of the object, and they should not cause damage. So this is a photograph of how not to do it. This is a specimen I found in the collection where I work. And it's a very small mineral specimen that has acquired two different numbers that are pasted on the mineral, so they're going to be very difficult to remove. And they actually obscure a good part of the mineral. So that's not a very good way to do that. There are much better ways to uh, label that object than the way it was done. Uh, the identifying number must be unique to that object and preferably part of a numerical sequence. And in some museums, they, they use letters along with numbers, so it's an alphanumeric uh, way to, to mark the accession. I've put two examples in here from natural history. One is a fossil that has the number written on it in India ink on a, 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 a spot of white paint that's laid down and then covered over with lacquer. And in this case, they have added in a locality, which normally isn't done, but they had lots of space. This is a, a mammoth jaw, so there's plenty of space. The other is a small frog, which you see already has uh, two labels. One is uh, a tag put on by the field collector, which was me. And then the second tag was the catalog tag when it entered the museum collection. And so both of those numbers take you to documentation about the specimen. So numbering and marking. And uh, this comes down to what system you use. The most commonly used identifying number is a compound sequential number recommended by the American Alliance of Museums. And this is probably the most widely used in the United States, probably worldwide. So this consists of a number year, the accession number, and an object number. So for example, 2018.23.5 here means this is the fifth object in the 23rd accession collected in the year 2018. So only one object will get that number. So this is widely used, but it also means you've got to put seven digits on an object. And if your object is very small, then that can get complicated. And if your object is one that contains parts, for instance, a teapot and teacups, then you, can, you have to start adding even more things. And in this case, traditionally, we add letters behind it. So your, your original number, 28.23.5, might go on the teapot. But A might go on a cup, and B might go on a saucer, and so forth, until you've cataloged the whole set. So you can get some fairly long numbers this way. But this is, the, as I say, the most common system to use. It's not uncommon to find uh, accession or catalog numbers that have alphabetic prefixes to designate the collection, such as, in this case, A7173. A indicates for this museum the archaeology collection. And some, of, some museums use very complex compound numbers that incorporate a collection designation, accession number, and catalog number all together. So in the case, this extremely long number, 14 is the accession number. 
H signifies that it's part of a history collection. 2018 is the year that the object came to the museum, and 212 is the object number. And so this is interesting, but it also is a very long number. Back in the days before we had computerized systems, it was important that your accession number uh, carry some kind of information with it because it sped things up as you were looking for objects in the collection. But now that you can get this information at your fingertips with a computer, I think we can use shorter numbers and drop a lot of the uh, complicated numbers that we've used in the past. But I've had no luck at all convincing people that we should just use simple numbers. So uh, most tr numbering systems are the result of tradition. And because of the complexity involved in renumbering objects, and because of the chance of making mistakes, most museums keep their old systems, whether they're a, they're a very good system or not. And this is probably wise. Renumbering objects can be extremely problematic. It takes a lot of staff time and resources. And as I said, you can make mistakes doing that. So if you have the opportunity to start a new numbering system at your museum, I would try to use the simplest system possible using the fewest digits possible. If you've inherited a numbering system that works, you are probably better off to keep using that rather than change it. And remember that uh, all of these dates and prefixes were used before we had um, electronic numbering, uh, electronic computers where we could pull these numbers up. And this is an interesting use of an accession number. And you'll note that the number, which is inside the red circle, is written backwards. And I was puzzled the first time I saw this until I realized uh, what was going on here. The, in this case, the accession number is written on the object twice, once correctly and once backwards. Because when these, ob when these paint it's, this is the back of a painting. When the painting was hung on the wall, this way you could check the accession number with a mirror without having to take the painting down. So they, this was in a collection of over 300 paintings that were on more or less permanent exhibit. And the curator could just hold a mirror up and read his accession numbers through the back to confirm that each, each painting was there when he did inventory. So clever use of the number. So uh, it is important as well to use standard nomenclature or taxonomy because to properly classify objects in the collection is an important way to reduce confusion. So uh, what we want to do with this is, is reduce confusion in the collection. And for an example of this is that there are 20 approved variant spellings of the name of the composer Peter Illich Tchaikovsky. But if you put those 20 names into a computer, unless you specifically link them together, the computer would see that as 20 different composers. So this is one reason that we try to use standardized names. And if you look at the object in the picture, you could call this just about anything. It could be a couch, or a Davenport, or a divan, or a lounge, or a settee, or a sofa, or a Chesterfield, any number of names. And depending on the name you use, you might or might not be able to find it. So this is, this is why we need to use standardized uh, names within our collections. And you know, the list of standardized names will be different for each collection, but it is going to work much better if you standardize your list of names. So here's an example from cataloging. Suppose you acquire this object, and in this case, a flower sister. You're going to catalog this as part of your registration process. So cataloging is the process of organizing the accession information. So you've, it's a descriptive process because you need to write out a description of what this object is. So you would write out the characteristics. And so you, there are many ways to do this. In this example, you might write down flower sister. 10, single screen type with one beater, painted cream with flower design, and a red wooden handle, a flat tin handle attached to the body with rivets. That is sufficient to identify this object in your collection. And so uh, that is one way to do it. Uh, this is commonly used in museums. This is an example from Peru, from their uh, the National Institute of Culture. And I picked this because it is in Spanish, because the trick is you don't need to read Spanish to see what they have done. You can see how the information is grouped. You can see where the numbers are. You can see the measurements. So this is a fairly standard way that collections used to be cataloged before computers. And in this case, they include a black and white image of the painting that is in this catalog. So this is, again, was common, a system commonly used uh, around the world. Uh, Cataloging is very different, though, for systems that already have uh, 
standardized nomenclature, and one of those is natural history. And in this case, we have a universally accepted system of names for plants and animals. So anywhere in the world you go, the names used are the same, which makes it a dispositive process rather than a descriptive process. Because cataloging now becomes dispositive. You put things in order. You don't have to describe them. So the specimen, when it gets a name, is assigned to an existing uh, classification. So here's an example. I was uh, working in Paraguay. And one night, we collected this viper that I'm holding. So once we knew what the viper was, once we got a good look at it, we realized it was a Bothrops nuidae. Well, the minute we had a specific name on the snake, we knew the entire uh, classification history of it. And so if you wanted to look at the details, it would go into our catalog with this information, ranging from the, from the animal kingdom, it's a chordate, it's a vertebrate, going on down through, it's a reptile, it's a viper, it's in the subfamily that includes rattlesnakes, and then there is the scientific name, and then there is also a common name. But most systems do not have a hierarchy built in as this one does. So natural history, uh, it's a little easier to catalog things because you have this, common, this handy series of names you can use. So there are a number of uh, vocabularies in taxonomies out there that you can use. And there's a number that are offered from the Getty. And there's a nice one from Canada Parks Classification System for Historic Collections. Uh, there is a, uh, in your handouts for today, you have the URLs for these, so you don't need to write them all down. But the Getty has the Art and Architecture Thesaurus. It's very widely used. They also have geographic names, the union list of artist names, cultural object names. There are other out there as well. I just took these as examples, and not everyone uses these. This is one of the problems with lack of standardization. What is being emphasized now is a system called uh, nomenclature for museum cataloging. It was originally developed by Robert Chenal in 1978 to classify human-made products. It is a hierarch hierarchical system, so it includes hierarchical classification, so it's designed to mimic the classifications used in natural history. However, it doesn't give you a specific name for every object. Instead, it gives you categories for classification. So as you might imagine, to try to come up with a listing of the name of every object worldwide, even in English, would be impossible. But by giving categories for classification, it can greatly simplify cataloging. The current version, the last most recently published one, has about 14,600 object categories. The system is set up so that objects are grouped into 10 principal categories, divided into classes and subclasses, and the objects are organized by their original function. So these are your, your 10 categories, the built environment, furnishings, personal objects, tools, and the tools relate to materials, science and technology, and communication. There's distribution and transportation objects, communication, recreation, and of course, a category for uh, unclassifiable objects. So you're not always able to classify every object, like my little green box. So our sifter would, would fall into this. It would be under tools and equipment for materials in the classification of food processing and preparation in the subclassification of food preparation equipment, and in the object term group of tool for food separating, and the secondary object term there is sifter. And so that would, uh, that would help you uh, classify this object. There is a list serve uh, for people interested in developing the system further. They are, it is now available online. This is also, some of you uh, may recognize, this is the same system that is incorporated into Past Perfect uh, software if you happen to use that. So it can be a very useful system depending on your collection. It does take a while to get used to it. And there are all these problems about where things go. But there is, I say, there is a list where a group can help you figure those things out. So it's been developing since 1978. And, but it is, it is a usable system. And uh, will help you quite a bit. Related to standard nomenclature is the, your collection storage array, how you arrange things in the storage. So this refers to the arrangement of the objects in storage. And again, you want to use a consistent system so that you have, can figure out the location uh, reliably. This speeds up retrieval, retrieval of objects and helps you provide a proper storage environment. I once saw a museum that arranged their collection. This was a history museum based on the Chenal system, which is a terrible thing to do because they had very large objects next to very small ones. 
so space was not used widely, and they had objects together that did not have the same requirements for a storage environment. So you don't want to do that, but you can base your uh, storage array on uh, your classification that you use in your, in your taxonomic system. There are uh, many types of ordering systems in museum. Typically in art museums, that ordering system is by artist name or maybe time period, more commonly by medium. So you have paintings together, works on paper together, sculpture together. can also be genre location. Natural history, as I mentioned before, they tend to use the hierarchical system because of the nature of that system. This tends to group objects by things that are more or less the same size. Uh, geology gets a little more complicated. It depends on how those collections are used. History can be all over the map uh, by material, by topical class, date, style. And as I say, some collections use the Chanel system for arranging storage array, which is probably not good. Anthropology can be my material or origin or cultural association. There are many, many, many other variations out there. I just wanted to give you a brief idea of what some of them are like. So what do we want? Well, ideally, we want the objects arranged according to their storage environment requirements. Because wooden objects do not necessarily need the same storage environment as metal objects. Some things can be exposed to more light, others cannot. Oil paintings can be exposed to more light than watercolors, for example. So you think about the storage environment. You also need to think about size and shape to make the best use of space. And ultimately, in practice, the uh, system of order is always a compromise between the size of the collections, the space you have available, how that collection is used, and how often objects are used, and the resources available to maintain it. So you're probably going to be hard pressed to find two museums that use exactly the same system for ordering things. But you do want to make sure that yours is a logical system that another person could come in and figure out very quickly how to find the objects needed. You don't want a system that's so complicated. One person has to be there to explain it for it to work. And uh, part of storage environment is, of course, exhibits. Uh, as my friend uh, Sally Shelton likes to point out, exhibition is a form of storage. And in many cases, uh, objects will spend a large part of their life in the museum on exhibit. And this is something we will talk about again next week. But you should look at your requirements for your exhibit environment should be the same as those for storage environment, particularly for objects on exhibit for a long time. So at this point, we need to pause briefly and talk about conservation. So conservation refers to the things that are done to prolong the useful life of objects. And by useful life, I mean the length of time that we can obtain information from a musealized object before it loses value through deterioration or loss of documentation. So conservation can roughly be broken down into uh, three general areas. Uh, the treatment of damaged objects, which we often think of as restoration. Conservation, research on ways to conserve objects, and preventive care of objects. And so the first two require a, a quite a bit of professional training as a conservator, and they're way beyond the scope of this course. But preventive care is part of collections management, so we are going to discuss that. So uh, based on my experience working in collections for about 50 years throughout the US, Latin America, and uh, quite a number in Europe and Asia, I'm guessing that probably 90% of preventive conservation is simply controlling the storage environment. Because the truth is, most objects are either in storage or on exhibit for most of their lives in the museum. And it's exposure to that environment that is going to determine uh, their long-term fate. So it is the storage environment where collection management meets conservation. It is very important to keep in mind that collection management is not conservation. And conservation is not collection management. But they have an overlap. And that overlap comes in the area of preventive conservation, and particularly in the storage environment. So by preventive conservation, we mean taking steps to prevent deterioration of objects. And this means we avoid the need for treatment or repair to objects because oh, they don't get damaged. And we do this. We, uh, we prevent this deterioration by providing a stable storage environment. So in the end, it is far more cost effective 
not to mention better for the objects, to prevent deterioration than to have to fix it. So preventive conservation is very cost effective. It might seem initially like you're putting a lot of your resources into monitoring the collection storage environment and getting things all set up. But in the end, over the course of 20, 30, 100 years, it is very, very cost effective. And so in order to do this, you need to understand the factors that cause objects to deteriorate in a collection. That has been much, made much easier thanks to the Canadian Conservation Institute who have developed the 10 agents of collection deterioration. So they have grouped the forces that affect objects into 10 uh, fairly easy to look at and uh, understand categories. And so we're going to go through these categories fairly briefly uh, one by one and take a look at them. The Canadian Conservation Institute has a fabulous set of web pages on these agents, and I've given you the URL for those pages uh, in your handout today. So if you want to explore uh, any one or all of these in more depth uh, afterwards, you, you can do that. So the first is direct physical forces. These are things like impact, shock, uh, from being something being dropped, vibration, which could come from heavy machinery, construction, a nearby railroad track, uh, pressure, improper handling, the kinds of things that occur like earthquakes, and of course something we call inherent vice, which is the tendency of organic material to break down, or in some, some cases unorganic materials, to break down because of materials they're composed of. So things like plastic and silk are not permanent because of the chemical nature of their composition. There is no way to save those objects forever, but other things, such as things that are made of wood or cotton, can be preserved uh, much longer. So this, uh, these images show two ways that direct physical forces have damaged objects. One of them was a fossil dinosaur bone, which is very heavy and very fragile, which is a bad combination. And it was handled improperly in moving it and snapped in two pieces. And it can never be repaired because of its weight. So that is permanent damage. The second thing is an overcrowded storage condition. And you can see damage has already occurred to a vase lying on the floor. It's been broken, that big clay jar. And other things are undoubtedly being damaged as well because of the bad storage environment. So what you can do is determine the physical forces that your collection might be subject to and figure out what you can do to prevent damage. Make sure each object in the collection uh, our own exhibit is adequately supported to protect it from shock and vibration. Write down instructions for anyone on your staff that handles objects so they have those to read and train your employees properly. And in this image, what we see is a series of photographs waiting to be hung in an exhibit. But rather than set them on the floor or on top of the, the plinth, they have been put on foam pads in order to protect them from vibrations that they might incur while they're being installed. The second category is thieves and vandals. And this is damage that comes from intentional actions by uh, uh, thieves or vandals. And here we see a taxidermy out of a grizzly bear was out where the public could get to it. And someone has snapped off one of the claws. And then they have actually broken the bear open by touching it to see if, it, if it's actually real. And for this, what we need is to improve security. And we can use barriers to separate people from objects. We need to train our staff to be vigilant, and we need to do regular inspections. And so some, some things for security are very complicated. Some are very simple. Here we have stanchions in an art gallery. And those work both as a physical barrier to keep people back and also as a psychological barrier to remind people that they are not supposed to touch the objects. Uh, the third uh, agent is dissociation, which is from comes from uh, Misplacing objects, removing tags or labels. It comes from illegible writing, so you can't understand it. Uh, the documentation was recorded on it using materials that weren't permanent and got lost, or you failed to get the right permits. You failed to upgrade your uh, computer software. There were errors made in transcription. Anything that results in loss of data, which results in, them in loss of value to the objects. So here you have two instances, a tag without a specimen. So that is now a meaningless tag. And you also have a label that was covered with mold. And so the mold is so bad, you can no longer read what that label says. So those are both losses of information. So uh, you should keep written records when objects are moved in or out of storage. You should establish a policy that prevents removing tags and labels. Uh, you should actually uh, check your handwriting when you hire new staff. When I, at the, 
was at the University of Kansas, I hired a lot of students. And in order to be hired, they had to pass a handwriting exam. And I made them write the words, I like to handle dead animals 10 times. And I told them to print. And if their printing wasn't clear on the 10th time, they did not get further consideration for the job, because I had too many instances where notes were left that were illegible. Uh, you should use archival quality materials in your documentation, and as I, we'll talk about those next week. You should upgrade your computer software on a regular schedule. Failure to do that will result in loss of information. And you should train your staff about the importance of avoiding dissociation. The fourth object is fire. And this, of course, can destroy, burn, and contaminate objects. It's got heat, flame, and ash, and then, of course, residue from smoke. It's usually a problem with building integrity or a lack of fire control, lack of detectors, or carelessness, so combustible materials are left around. These are two photographs that were in the news recently. This is the National Museum of Brazil that was on almost total loss. One is the fire at night, and the other is the museum the next morning. Very sad loss. Uh, you can also, though, have damage from fire suppression. And uh, you can have more damage caused by cleaning up after a fire by the chemicals used than you can from the fire itself. I have met curators who did not want uh, sprinkler systems in their collection because of the force of water when the sprinkler systems are activated and their fear that the sprinkler heads might be accidentally activated. The failure rate on those is extremely low. And if you have to call the fire department, the water pressure in the hoses they use will be at least five times that coming out of a sprinkler. Uh, and this is uh, image is yet another Brazilian fire. This was a number of years ago. And this was the Butantan Institute, where they lost a collection of extremely valuable specimens of snakes that had been accumulated over 100 years. They were just two weeks away from moving into a new building with a sprinkler system when this fire broke out. So you should keep electrical, electrical connections out of storage. A, a trick question I like to ask people is, how many electrical outlets should storage have? The correct answer is none. Uh, you should have portable fire extinguishers in the storage and work areas. The reason I say no electrical outlets is because if there is no electrical outlet, no one can plug anything in, like a hair dryer or a radio that might cause a fire. Train your staff in how to use extinguishers. Most of us have been around them all our lives. Very few of us have ever actually taken one out on the parking lot and tried to fire it to see how it worked. You should have smoke and fire alarms, because some things burn hot, some burn with a lot of smoke. And if, particularly if you're a small institution, usually your local fire department is happy to come over and do a walkthrough and discuss fire safety with you. They would much rather have, uh, have you avoid a fire than have to come to your place and put one out. Uh, this brings us to water. Uh, water damage can come from floods, uh, drips, or leaks. Uh, it can stain objects. It can cause extraction of chemicals, oxidation of metals delamination and warping of many materials, shrinkage and swelling. And one of the things I point out on water is you should do your own inspections of the roof, the windows, the drains, and piping. And you may have a facilities person who does that, but as a collections manager, you should do your own. What you're looking at in this picture is mold that has grown and plaster that has fallen off of a wall because of a clogged gutter in a roof. Uh, several stories up. And the water came through the wall and did all this damage and is now affecting the collection. So you should uh, do your own inspections of that roof, windows, gutters, downspouts, floor drains, uh, indoor pipes and tubing, and check faucets for leaks. And then you should certainly monitor any construction going on nearby that involves digging holes where water pipes might get broken. So here we have two examples of water damage. Uh, one occurred in our museum back in May. And it was an exhibit case flooded in the middle of the night when an overhead pipe broke. The pipe broke because it had been damaged by an asbestos abatement crew the day before, and they hadn't noticed they'd cracked it. And it broke during the night. Another one is a roof gutter that is completely clogged with plants and debris and is going to flood the building sooner or later. The sixth uh, agent is pests. These include insects, other arthropods, mold, bacteria, rodents, any organism that causes damage to the collections or serves as a food source for other collection pests. And in many cases, other agents of deterioration will affect pests, such as humidity and temperature. For instance, the books on the right were damaged by silverfish, which is a pest. But silverfish require very high humidity to live. And you shouldn't have silverfish in your museum. You should not have your humidity that high. 
Uh, and in general, most pest control is done through a program of integrated pest management, which we will not get into. There are many other places you can find information about integrated pest management uh, on the web. But it involves regular inspections using traps, sticky traps and light traps, and habitat modification, and then, of course, control of your other agents. There are many kinds of traps, and the placement on some of these is critical. For instance, the light traps emit ultraviolet, so you don't want to use those where they, the light can affect your collection. And you want to make sure that sticky traps and flypaper are kept away from places where they might actually come into contact with your objects. The seventh one is, is uh, contaminants. And there are three classes of contaminants, organic gases, inorganic gases, and particulate pollutants. And particulate pollutants may be acidic or abrasive or both. And a good example of this is cigarette smoke. The cigarette smoke contains ash, and the ash is abrasive, and it's also acidic. There's also dust, acidic vapors, acidic particles, automobile emissions, and then chemicals within the museum can, can cause contamination. And in this case, the shot of the dust is a, a dust storm that was going on when I was in Qatar. And by midday, you could not see across the bay to, uh, to the Big Island. Uh, and of course, all of this dust was infiltrating through and into the museums there, so they all had to have uh, special filters to keep it out. Your sources of interior contamination in museums uh, come f uh, from combustion products and human activities and cleaning materials, particularly products used in exhibition and in renovation. And these are uh, things like uh, uh, paints, uh, adhesives, solvents. Here we have several mothballs contain naphthalene, which can recrystallize on your specimens. Uh, old containers will often go bad, as that leaking container of Santa Flush is done. And those open cans of paint are producing volatile organic compounds, VOCs, which can do great damage to the collection as well. So you want to check all the products used in your building. Make sure you know what they are. If you smell an odor, find out what it is. It may be something all right. It may be something producing contaminants. You should store your chemicals, including cleaning supplies, in a safety cabinet where the fumes are contained. You should not keep old chemicals or paints around, because they will de the containers will deteriorate. You should change your heating and cooling system filters regularly and make sure that you have the right kind of filters and impose a regular housekeeping schedule. The eighth uh, agent of deterioration is radiation. This includes uh, heat and light and uh, ultraviolet. And of these, ultraviolet has the most energy and does the most damage. This is not to say that heat doesn't do damage, but we worry more about ultraviolet because it is so much more damaging than, than other forms of radiation. But radiation can cause disintegration of material, uh, discoloring, darkening, yellowing. And radiation damage in objects, just like it is in humans, is cumulative. You cannot recover. The objects cannot recover from it. So here we see deterioration of a high-density polyethylene container. Normally, high-density polyethylene is inert and pretty stable, but this one was exposed to sunlight and the ultraviolet as having this effect of making it crack later. So you should reduce the amount of light in storage and exhibit areas as much as you can. And in storage, of course, you can keep it in the dark when people are not in the room. If you reduce the ambient lighting in your galleries, the exhibit lighting can be reduced. If you have a lot of ambient light in your galleries, you'll have to crank the light up so people can see the objects. That's a good argument for having a dark galleries. And of course, you should pull ultraviolet filters on all ultraviolet producing light sources and keep sunlight, or at least direct sunlight, out of exhibits and storage areas. And as, of course, we could talk for a day about any one of these agents. We just need to go through these uh, fairly quickly. Agent number nine is incorrect temperatures. And these are one temperatures that are too high, too low, or fluctuate excessively. So you should select your temperature set points so you can achieve them with minimal fluctuations with the heating and cooling equipment you have. This may mean you have a warmer temperature for summer and a cooler one for winter. That's OK, as long as that warmer and cooler one can be kept uh, a lot more stable. And because the one thing you want to re reduce is the fluctuations and, uh, in temperature, because these fluctuations can cause cracking and peeling and uh, of paint and all sorts of, of uh, other damage. So here we have three examples of temperature that uh, has fluctuated too much and the damage it's done. The first of these 
is uh, a piece of ivory that is cracking. The second one is teeth, which of course are also made of ivory and they're cracking. Ivory is going to crack no matter what because uh, the outside of ivory dries out faster than the inside. But if you can keep it in a more stable temperature and humidity, you can slow that damage down. The third uh, image here is a painted, uh, the door of a painted metal case that had been in the museum for more than 20 years, and it was moved into an area of unstable temperature, and the expansion and contraction of the metal caused a 20-year-old paint layer to pop off. So that was an expensive to replace. The last agent is incorrect relative to humi uh, relative humidity, and we uh, tend to look at this in three categories. Humid, which is above 75% relative humidity. Humidity that is above or below a critical value, which is where our set point where we try to maintain it. And then, of course, the fluctuations. Relative humidity is temperature dependent because warm air holds more moisture than cold air. So that means if your temperature is going up and down, your relative humidity is going up and down as well. So humidity affects chemical and physical stability of many materials. If your relative humidity gets above 65 or 70 percent, it can trigger mold growth uh, very quickly. So here we see images of a failure of a lath and plaster ceiling from high humidity and oxidation of metal shelving, all caused by too much humidity. So what you want to do is uh, make sure that your air conditioning systems and dehumidifiers, if you use those to reduce relative humidity, are in good working order. And you want to uh, keep the make sure the filters get changed regularly. You can also, if you have a especially a temporary high humidity situation, lower the relative humidity by increasing air circulation by moving the air with fans. Of course, all three of these, air conditioning, dehumidifiers, and fans, mean you're moving electrical uh, appliances into storage, which increases your risk from uh, fire. So there are other ways to control humidity, and one of them is microenvironments. So here are two examples of microenvironments. These are both fairly low cost. Uh, on the left is a box. It is a um, polyethylene box, it's clear. It contains in the bottom a layer of silica gel. There is an inert layer of, um, I, I don't recall exactly what kind of board was used. I believe it is, let's see, I believe it's polyethylene foam over that to separate the specimens from the foam. And in, uh, the upper part contains specimens of pyrite, which is very uh, humidity sensitive. There is a simple relative humidity card inserted in the box so you can see how much, uh, what the relative humidity is and know when it's time to refresh the silica gel. And if kept closed, and this is of course closed and then tape shut, it provides a very low cost, very stable microenvironment. And of course you do have to keep an eye on this over time, but it will provide a nice microenvironment. On the right is a system that I found in use at the Museum of the Inca in Cusco, Peru, where they had very limited electricity and very little money. They were able to buy some indicator silica gel in a microwave. And they kept all of their metal objects in closed cabinets with indicator silica gel to keep the humidity below 60. And when the indicator silica gel changed color, they could pull it out and dry it in the microwave. So those are fairly simple microenvironment uh, solutions. So this graph comes from the Image Permanence Institute, which has done some great work on storage environments. And uh, this is a good visualization of what affects the storage environment within the building. And this begins with the outside climate, the integrity of your building envelope, how well your heating and cooling systems function, and how well you manage that storage area itself. So what do we want? In general, we want cool rather than hot. And our set points, the exact temperatures, will depend on where we're located in our building. We want dry rather than wet, so preferably below 65. We want stable temperature and relative humidity with only minor fluctuations. And we want to get rid of ultraviolet light. So it's actually pretty simple what we're after. It does not necessarily take a lot of resources to improve the storage environment. For instance, you can improve the capacity of the building to buffer the outside environmental conditions, which is cost effective because buildings have a longer maintenance cycle than control equipment. So you might install, for instance, thermal pane windows, which, adjust, which respond to changes in temperature differently than your building's heating and cooling system. You can review your uh, operational procedures to find ways you can uh, improve environmental control, such as keeping all the doors to the collection area closed. 
You can make sure your filters stay clean. And you can store things in closed cabinets because it's easier to control humidity in a small cabinet than a big one. And we see here a set of louvers on which dust is accumulated, which should be a big hint that you need to get behind those louvers and check the filter, which is undoubtedly dust covered. You can keep your heat very low in the winter. You can add weather stripping to uh, storage area doors to help me keep a more stable internal environment. You can keep your heating and cooling system at the same level day and night to reduce fluctuations. Keep food out of storage to keep pests off. You can install cloth curtains on open shelving uh, by using Velcro or magnets or something like that. And you can put new gaskets on your cabinets and latrines. And what you want to avoid is the situation we're looking at here where we have a, roof, a leak in the roof and the emergency response has been to dash in and drape plastic over the cabinets, but that's not going to solve the long-term problem. In your storage design, if you have a chance to uh, affect storage design, you can uh, do some things that will make your life easier. Storage areas should be at or above grade, because below grade, they are more likely to have moisture penetration. Storage areas should be in the center of the building, because that is more stable than a room with an outside wall. If possible, avoid storing collections in attics, because they get too hot, or basements, because they get too damp, or any rooms of outside walls, because that causes more fluctuation in temperature and humidity. You should have secure areas, so that means limit access. And of course, avoid any kind of overhead pipes or tubing, which can leak. And don't let anyone insert a work area or a desk into the storage room. A storage room should not be a place where people sit to work. Things should be brought out of the storage room to work on them. If you have a chance to affect building design, you want wide hallways and doorways that do not have sharp corners, blind corners, or bottlenecks. And this, by wide, I mean big enough that you can move your biggest storage equipment, your biggest cabinets or uh, cases or shelves up and down the hallways with no problem for those times when you need to rearrange storage. Uh, you want, if you have a loading dock, if you're going to get a new one, look to try to get at least 16 to 20 feet of clearance. The loading dock should be big enough to house the equipment you use to unload. If you bring in heavy objects, that means a lot of big equipment. The storage, the collection storage should not be near the loading dock because the loading dock is a source of incoming pests and, of course, rapid temperature and humidity change. I recommend in storage painting the walls and ceilings white. There are two reasons for this, one of which is the white reflects light, so you can use far less light and see better. And the other is you can see evidence of pests or other problems better on white. If you pick a paint with titanium oxide or zinc oxide, that will help absorb any ultraviolet. And of course, no carpeting, because carpeting is uh, harbors pests. I do not like drop ceilings in storage, the suspended ceilings, because again, these are avenues for pests, and they collect dust. And you want your storage facility in the center of the building. If you're looking at compactor shelving, movable shelving, that can save you a lot of space. But make sure before you make that commitment, you check your floor loading. Because compactors, of course, save you space by increasing the amount of things you can put in a room, which doubles your floor load. And not all buildings uh, can hold those. You can get compactors that will hold massive loads, but you've got to make sure that your building uh, floor will sustain those. Part of this, too, is your storage furniture. It is cost effective to buy the best storage furniture you can. A lot of people want to save money by buying lesser quality storage furniture. But in the long run, the better storage furniture, the better made, the better finish with the doors that close tighter is going to last longer and perform better and take better care of your collection in the long run. So this is one of those penny-wise, pound-foolish solutions. So spend the money for the better equipment. It will last much longer. Uh, Storage furniture should be acquired in modular units, so that will make it easier for you to rearrange as time goes by or if your museum moves. You should look for low-maintenance, non-reactive materials. Generally, for metals, what we want is a powder coat or electrostatic finish. This is the kind of paint that is on, for instance, on cars. It's uh, very hard to damage and doesn't off-gas. Your storage furniture should be elevated 5 centimeters above the floor fairly easy to do. You can put things up on blocks. The reason for this is it has been discovered that insects and, and other collection pests don't like to move into open areas. And they are far less likely to move from one cabinet to another if those cabinets are up 
off the floor. And you should in, avoid cabinet designs that have crevices or open channels in them because those are also areas that can uh, harbor pests. So those are all things you can do when you look for storage furniture that will uh, save you money in the long time. And we also want to mention housekeeping because this is a big part of uh, preventive conservation. So the National Park Service has an interesting definition of clean. They say that clean in museums means that enough collected dirt has been removed so that deterioration will not take place. It does not mean spotless or white glove or squeaky clean. So that's a pretty good definition of clean. I think that would, would help most of us in museums decide uh, what to do. And notice that clean does not mean gleaming, shining, shimmering, or polished either. It just means clean. And so given that definition, what do they mean by housekeeping? And they define housekeeping as all of the ongoing actions or tasks to preserve museum objects, archives, and museum records. Housekeeping requires looking as much as doing. Knowing when not to clean is just as important as knowing when to clean. So people don't like to think about housekeeping. We certainly do this enough at home without having to do it at work as well. But it is critically important. It's one of those ways that we actually fulfill our legal and ethic obligations to care for our collections. If we do regular inspections, we will wind up doing less cleaning because we can clean things when there's still a small amounts of dirt rather than large. You should always inspect each object carefully before you clean it. You should use non-invasive techniques. And in many cases, avoid overcleaning. And for on many objects, patinas actually add protection. And some they don't, but some they do. Uh, they are often uh, part of the integrity of the object. And then when in cleaning, I like to recommend the principle of least, which is use the least amount of chemicals for the least amount of time when cleaning. So this is another picture of uh, my wife, Julianne. So she has the exalted title of assistant director of the museum. And here she is down on her knees cleaning an exhibit case. So you might ask, why is the assistant director of the museum cleaning an exhibit case? And the answer is, it needs to be clean. And there is no one else available to do it. So she does it herself, and which is the attitude I think we should all have in our museums. We take care of what needs to be done. Uh, cleaning techniques should be reversible. For example, wax can be removed, but rust can't. We don't want to do damage. When you're cleaning, particularly cleaning objects, don't rush. Take your time. Speed can kill, or in this case, damage objects. You don't want to bring dirt inside your building unnecessarily. Less dirt coming in means less cleaning, which means less cleaning agents and equipment and less handling of the objects. So, uh, you can clean your high traffic areas, such as entrances and exits and around windows more uh, often. You can get floor mats that are designed to pick up dirt from people's shoes so that they track less dirt into your collections. And that will help. So we've gone through a lot of stuff. I'll sum this up and so we can get to some questions. And so we can review some of the key basic things that need to be done to take care of any collection. So, Stabilize and preserve each object as it is accessioned. Move those objects into a stable storage environment where they will be uh, kept long term. This means you need to allocate each object to a specific place in your collection storage array. So there's only one place that an object goes so you know exactly where to find it or where to put it back. You want to support the objects physically in storage. And that, of course, how you support them depends on the object. but there are ways to support these things. Uh, you want to inspect the objects regularly. This means daily or weekly. Do walkthroughs of your collection storage and your exhibit areas to make sure everything is OK. This is part of monitoring. And you want to also monitor the storage environment and exhibition spaces. And this means keeping an eye on temperature and relative humidity and lights. And you want to ameliorate or, if you can, eliminate the agents of collection deterioration. So if you can follow these basic seven steps, you are going to go a long way towards preserving your collection into the future. So the assignment this week, uh, for those of you that would like to do the Credly Badge, or those who would just like to do this for fun, uh, you, what I want you to do is describe very briefly your registration procedures at your museum, accessioning and cataloging, and say whether you think they're adequate or not, or whether you think they can be improved, or whether they're doing a good job. Similar your number and marking systems. And ditto for your collection storage environment and your collection storage furniture. So uh, I will read all of the essays you send in. And 
if appropriate, I will send you some comments back on them. But the main thing is to, for you to start thinking about whether these four uh, systems in your museum are working well or whether you think they can be improved. Um, so if you can do that, that would be very good, and, and post those to the website. Before we get to questions, I would like to mention our next two webinars. Next week, uh, webinar three, we will talk about use of collections, documentation of objects in the collection, exhibition and loans, research, and access to collections. And in the following week in our last webinar, webinar four, we will talk about collections management policies, legal issues, and then uh, look at some resources and programs for collection management uh, training. So I think that brings us to the question period for today. And it looks like quite a number of uh, collections have accumulated over here in the parking lot. So I, I, can, I can just start at the top here. Susan, is that correct? Yes. And um, okay. before you start, I just wanted to mm -hmm. say that um, you should check our webinars. We just it's, we have a whole series of webinars on, on integrated pest management. We have we just did one on silica gel. In in the it, we have upcoming a webinar on light. We've done light before. We have one on fire coming up. We have a course on housekeeping that's coming up this fall. And there's the reorg course, which is deals with a lot of the storage collection, uh, the storage issues that you brought up. And um, if you have problems caring for your collections, you can always go to the Connecting to Collections Care Community discussion. And if you look on our website, it will tell you how to get to the, the new location of the discussions. There are always uh, conservators there that are monitoring to answer questions that are appropriate for uh, small and mid-sized cultural institutions who, is, who we deal with. So John, take it away. Yeah, and it's a great way to get uh, free advice from some really well-trained and very well-known conservators. It's a great setup. OK, first question from Catherine Hayes. How can you pursue the return of an object found to be stolen from a collection? First thing you want to do is gather together the documents that prove that it should be, assuming it's from your collection. So prove that it's yours. And then from there here on, it's going to depend on the, the value of the object, the market value, and where it is. If it, it's turned up somewhere where you are, can comfortably approach whoever has it, you can approach them and make your case and say that the, legally this is yours and here is your proof. If that doesn't work, it's going to be a matter of calling in either law enforcement or getting a lawyer. And that will depend on how long ago it was, it was stolen and under what circumstances. But the first thing you need to do, of course, is prove it's yours. And that's where you go back to your accessioning documents. Uh, John, uh, yes. John, you missed a question before that, which is oh, I'm what sorry. should you do I don't, I don't if you. there's a, a known stolen object in your collection? Oh, I see it. Here it is. OK, what should you do if there is a known stolen object? OK. If you know where it was stolen from, uh, it should be returned. If you're not sure, you can try to investigate and find out. And in most of these cases, you know, we read about these in the paper all the time that a museum has returned a stolen object. And of course, part of that is the museum actually takes a loss when that happens. There is no fund to compensate museums for doing the right thing and returning stolen objects. But it's also illegal to possess a stolen object because it's stolen. Therefore, it that you did not acquire it legally, even if you meant to. So these things do need to be returned. But uh, I would begin by, if you if you know where it came from, try to contact the rightful owner and, and return it. OK, uh, let's see. Next is, doesn't the large size of numbers at the Mercer Museum devalue the objects? Well, yes and no. It does devalue them, except the purpose of that collection. It, it was collection was made in the turn of the century by an archaeologist uh, named Mercer, who was concerned that the crafts were disappearing from America because of industrialization. So he went out and collected all the tools used in crafts. And this is everything from making tortoise shell combs to tile to uh, printing. He collected all of these things for the purpose of showing 
how what tools were used with crafts. So most of these don't have great provenance on them. They don't have necessarily have historical associations. And these were made to show people the tools. And so, so for that reason, he put the big numbers on them. But yes, it does, in a way, devalue them. But if you look at the purpose of the museum, it actually gives them value because of the way they're arranged. And it is marvelous. If you're if like me, if you like tools, it is fabulous to go through this place and see these complete sets of you know wood shop and metal shop tools or complete kitchen setups with all of these objects in them. But yeah, that is a consideration to be made. And, and that's why, of course, other people don't put great big numbers on their objects. OK, Carla says, shouldn't the teapot in the 680, oh yeah, I was just trying to use an example of adding the letters A and B. And if you ask a question like that on uh, the collection stewardship list server museum L, you will wind up in an all day discussion with four or five other people arguing about how the letter should be applied. So it, it depends, but what you want to do is pick a system that you use in your collection and use that system consistently. That's the main thing. Uh, some museums might take that same T set and catalog each object individually and give each one its own number. It depends. So there is no absolute right and wrong on that. So yes, Past Perfect does have a, a version of the nomenclature built into it. I'm not sure which one they use. But it's, it, it, it is very helpful. And it's also a good way to see how the nomenclature works. Uh, let's see. How do you get a handwriting test past HR? Uh, HR never raised it with me. I had a series of questions I asked students. And I had written into the job description that legible handwriting was required for the job. And they accepted that as a job skill. And it's just like lifting heavy objects or being able to drive a stick shift. These are standard skills. And uh, I never had it questioned, but probably because I had it in the job description. And uh, I believe that that was also in the job description when I left and was replaced by another person. So the thing is, you need to discuss that with HR first. That is a necessary skill for the job. And the, you know, the explanation is very simple. Bad handwriting will result in loss of information. I, I had many notes that I found from my predecessors and from students that were illegible. And they would be critical information, like the locality where a specimen was collected. And we can't have that. That just doesn't count. That doesn't work. Let's see. I have to type everything but do the handwriting issues. Well, yes, it is much easier to read. Uh, I will confess uh, here that my handwriting, my cursive handwriting, is awful. Uh, however, I print really clearly. <laughs> but uh, when I write letters, uh, I tend to write cursive, which even I have trouble reading sometimes. But if I'm working in the museum, I print everything because printing is much clearer. Let's see, are there UV issues with LED lighting? Uh, as far as I know, there are not. And Susan, you, you're a conservator, yes, so you are. might correct me on this. Pardon? There are. And uh, you, okay. can get, you can get uh, uh, shields for them. And you can also check in the specs for the light. And I okay, well, think we may have something on that in our archives. Um, I, yeah, and I believe this came up on Museum L last week as well, or part of the collection stewardship yeah. list, one of the lists. And, okay, and our, go ahead. And it, as I said, we are going to do a, a webinar on lighting in museums in the fall, in November, I think. So all keep right. an eye out for that. Okay, but it's not all LEDs, is that correct? That's right. Yeah, because we and had our. Exhibit lighting used to be PAR 35s, and we were able to take advantage of a university cost-saving program and have those changed over to LED spots. And then we also have some LED lighting that we purchased at a hardware store that we've installed in our exhibit cases. And I checked all of those with a UV meter and a light meter, and I got no UV out of the ones we have. But that's only two or three kinds, and there's a lot of kinds of, of LEDs. Yeah, that's right. Market. And um we did a course in the fall on exhibits that included a webinar on lighting. That's going to be made available uh, soon. But that's something that you'll have to pay for, which, but you'll have access to all the materials from that. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And, and another aspect of that is 
I don't trust any specs to a certain degree. So I I happen to have a UV meter, and any time we change lights at the museum, I go in and check them because I have seen lights mislabeled before, and specs yeah. that are printed wrong, and things get in the wrong box. And I I have found more than once people using a light they thought was safe or or uh, produce very little light that, that was completely wrong. So if you if you can afford the meter, and you you can get a a decent UV meter for not all that much money and around 150. I I would check them. I don't I don't I just don't trust labels. <laughs> UV meter. UV meters are usually more expensive than that, but a lot of uh, state museum well, associations it, have UV meters that you can borrow. Yeah, if you get the com combination UV meter where you're reading microwatts per lumen, those are expensive. If you get a straight up UV meter, though, you can acquire one adequate for testing lighting or uh, uh, not much at all. But in order to calculate your microwatts per lumen, you also have to have a visible light meter and do the math. Uh, OK, where were we? Uh, should staff monitor storage rooms daily? I think, yes, you should. Uh, I made it my custom when I was in the two museums uh, where I used to work to do a complete walkthrough of the collection rooms every day. And at first, it seemed like a, a waste of time. But over time, I got to know those rooms really well. And I began picking up uh, the slightest little thing that was out of place, things that were shelved wrong, uh, accumulation of dirt on the floor that indicated a filter needed to be changed, movement of pests. So I think you should you know, go through every day. And on I, over I, I know that in we did a webinar the beginning of last year on security. And one of the things that we had as handouts in that are opening and closing checklists. And they're very helpful. So that oh, if you a have a procedure point. when you close, that part of it is in, you know going through the making sure the lights are out, making just walking through the storage, it's really helpful. Well, that's a very good point, Susan, because that also then gives you a document that you have done the that's checking right. if you've gone through that's a checklist. Right. And who did okay. it. OK, yeah, and who did it. On overcleaning and patinas, when, how do you know when to clean rust off old metal objects? I would ask a conservator. I, that's not the kind of question you should attempt to figure out on your own. And it's going to depend on the type of metal and the thickness and how you're going to do it. So that's one where you need definitely consult with an expert before you try. Uh, we, we've got a problem now that there's too many of these TV shows where people go out and buy antiques and quote unquote restore them. And they usually do this in a very brutal way. And they totally devalue the objects in the course of it. And they don't use good materials. And a lot of people have picked up the idea that this is, this is how it should be done. So be careful. That, make sure your expert is actually an object conservator, not someone who set them up in the business of restoring things. Is there a recommended list of cleaning, cleaning products? I do not know of one. There probably is. Uh, I uh, have not yes. seen one. OK. Um, there are, and I think the Park Service has one. Um, I don't know. I, I'll look and see. We may even have one on our website. I'm not sure. OK, great. Okay, and then Carla points out that Packin has great resources for practical collections care. And that, that is true. Great organization. Uh, let's see. Cleaning everything with Murphy's oil. Well, we, we won't go into that <laughs> at this point. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, and Murphy's oil, of course, isn't an oil, but it is not uh, very good for your objects either. Has anyone had luck getting institutions to understand that good collection storage is expensive, but that it saves money in the long term? I am at a university that has refused for years to address the condensation problem in the museum itself which is a purpose-built museum. That is a really tough call. And I have found that rather than make the case that it is damaging your objects, which of course it is, you can make the case that it's damaging your building. If you have a leak in a roof, physical, structural damage is occurring to the building, which will shorten the life of the building, and the university will have to tear it down and build another one. That will resonate with an administrator far more than the collection. Uh, 
There's another thing you can do, which is look at what it's doing to your collection storage environment, particularly if it's affecting your interior humidity. There is a great uh, device if you go to the IPI, the Image Permanent Institute website, called the Dew Point Calculator. And you can plug in actual numbers for your temperature and relative humidity and storage. And it will show you, it shows you when you reach dew point, but it also gives you a generalized index of collection deterioration based on combining data from lots of different kinds of collections. And at, you can sit there in front of an administrator or a, or a facilities person and change those numbers, and they can watch the graph go up and down and see the effect. And I have found that because of the way they're trained, a lot of facilities managers can grasp what's going on in that graph a lot better than they will understand what you're talking about when you try and tell them. So you might look at that, that physical resource as that, or that uh, optical resource as well. But well, you do need to make a case. Yeah, uh, sometimes oh, it, it helps to let, uh, I, I did a cab once where the people had a horrible uh, moth problem all through the museum. And the board just wasn't interested in it. And I was taken into one storage area where the museum director said, I don't know, somebody left all these cornflakes on the floor. Oh. But what it was was <laughs> moth, um, moth larvae oh. um, that had eaten a rug. And oh, so yeah. <laughs> I put together a quick uh, PowerPoint. We invited the board. Within uh, two weeks, they had gotten the, the state university insect people to come, and they actually tented the whole house. This was a horse, historic house. And they threw out things that had been yeah. just totally destroyed by the moss. So. Yeah, well, that's something um, else. If you have evidence of pests, you might physically collect that evidence and take it in and put it on someone's desk in front of them. And if you've got mold growing, you can point out that that is it can be a very serious health hazard. If anyone in your building has a compromised immune system and breeds in mold spores, it can make them very, very sick. Um, we have a few more minutes, so. Mm -hmm. I think there's a couple um, of questions yet still here. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, another of the stacks of paper. D. Okay, I believe those are just comments. Okay, go ahead, Susan. Um, yeah, so tune in next week. Uh, let us know if you have any problems. Um, you can always contact me at my email. And, um, and, pay, and, Look at our website because we do have a lot of these things. I'm in the process of also making a directory in our archives that will be by uh, topic, so by agents of deterioration and that kind of stuff. So thanks, John. And thank you, Mike. And right, Thank um, you, and thank you, Susan and Mike, and thank you to all of you for uh, sitting through this. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you next week.